This is Guitar Business Radio, the podcast for the business of guitar. No reviews, no demos, no idle chatter, just useful dialogue and information to help you get the most out of your guitar-related business. Whether you're a guitar builder or a guitar player, or just something in between, this is for you. Now, here's your host. Oh, wait, it's me, Jeffrey D. Brown. So let's get to it. Welcome to GBR. This is episode 14, officially released on May 14th, 2018 in Newport Beach, California, in the United States of America. And I say all of that just in case this episode ends up in a time capsule somewhere and it's like 100 years later or something. I mean, what do you think folks in that time period might think of this podcast or any podcast for that matter? Well, it's hard to know, but rather than speculate about something that far-fetched, I'm just going to tell you that today I have as my guest on the show, Tom Bedell, who's the owner of Breed Love Guitars, Bedell Guitars, and Weber Mandolins. He's going to tell us why he's creating customer experiences and not just building guitars. He'll also give us some history, philosophy, science, and perspective on how he runs his business and where he's going with it in the future. So that will be coming up in just a few moments. And also, at the end of the show, right where it always is, you'll find the value shot where today we're continuing our discussion about taking your business or career to the next level. And in this segment, I'll be talking more about leveraging your knowledge in Next Level Part 5. So in episode one, I took the opportunity to throw out a brief plug for one of my own projects that I've been involved with for the past 10 years or so, which some of you may know. It's called Guitar PR. And I thought that maybe 14 episodes later, I could maybe drop in another word or two. Now, we do a lot of different things, but about three years ago, we created a structured press release program for small and medium-sized companies that would be available at a reasonable and predictable cost. The program is called our Concierge Primary Release Package, and it's a robust 10-step process designed to craft marketable news for our clients in a multi-purpose press release format. Now, you've heard me talk about this stuff in general, but we put a lot of emphasis on message clarity and effectiveness. We use many of the techniques outlined in earlier segments of the value shot. We make sure that we check off the three C's and a lot more. I spent a lot of time talking about the three C's. In my opinion, that part of the process is worth the price of admission alone, but we go a lot further and we provide distribution and follow-up as well. But I say all of that really because for the first time since we introduced this program in 2015, we've rolled out a major upgrade to it with enhanced features and a lot more value added and some great pricing as well. And you can find out more about all of this at guitarpr.com. Just click on Concierge Services. And also for our GBR listeners, there's a special incentive that you can take advantage of in the form of a $50 credit on any release package. Just use our group code GBR2018. And by the way, for those of you who may want to try this at home, we've just posted a very useful document called Tips for Writing a Press Release. It's got a lot of helpful information and it's available to all of our GBR supporters on Patreon. So check that out as well. And now, for something of more epic proportions. This is your source for profoundly interesting news briefs. Guitar Business Radio presents The Shorts. Well, I have to be honest with you, we didn't have a lot of time in this episode for the shorts. But frankly, the intro music is so integral to the show that I just had to leave it in. So I have a quick story from the origins of the shorts, which was originally a segment in Trade Show Blues, a comical and uh, somewhat irreverent online journal I produced for the trade show industry starting way back in 2002. It ran for quite a few years. We had a lot of fun with it. And in those really primitive internet days, it was in many ways easier to get people to respond to stuff because the noise level was just nothing compared to today. And we wanted to ask our readers to participate, much like we still try to do today. And so for that particular segment, we simply sent out the message that stated, send us your shorts, which meant, of course, send us your interesting news stories or briefs, as we called them. Well, I'm not going to get into any detail on what we got, but if you want to let your imagination run a bit wild, that's what we got. Not to say it wasn't amusing, it was, but didn't really give us 
quite what we needed at the time. So I would just say, if you see anything or you know about something you think we should cover right here in the shorts, let us know. We're interested. But now, before things really get out of hand, it's time for something completely different. Well, Tom Bedell started his first guitar business at around the age of 14. 14. And today, just a few decades later, he's the owner of three well-known and respected brands in the industry. How did he get here from there? What does it all mean now? And where is the future taking him? You know, we could all wait around for a time capsule to show up, or we could just ask him as Tom Bedell joins us right here and right now on GBR. Well, Tom, thanks so much for coming on the show with us today. It's really great to have you. Thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate the invitation. Excellent. Excellent. Well, listen, let's get started. You know, so I, I, I guess our listeners are kind of getting used to the format here, but uh, uh, we always like to start off with some foundational background so that we understand, that listeners understand a bit more about what your business and, and career has been built on. So I'm wondering if you could give us a little history lesson. Well, Jeff, I'm a baby boomer. I was born in 1950 and um, lived through the, the Leave it to Beaver years for a while. And then uh, <laughs> certainly the awakening years of the 1960s with oh, yeah. uh, the folk rock music. I'm sure you remember uh, us going to the coffee houses and I'm afraid playing so. the latest Bob Dylan <laughs> songs and writing our poetry and having our friends help us. Well, um, I started giving guitar lessons at the local music store in Spirit Lake, Iowa, uh, when I was 13. And the class got all filled up and we were selling a lot of guitars because that was the, the time when people really wanted to express themselves, their thoughts, their feelings about society and their role in society. And so instead of teaching out of Mel Bay's book, uh, She'll Be Coming Around the Mountain, <laughs> I taught the stuff that uh, we all really cared about. Things didn't work out at the store. Um, so I went home and asked my folks if I could set up a, a lesson studio. Of course, they were more than happy to help me with that. My dad had a contact in Japan. He was in the fishing business and um, had an agent that helped him purchase parts. So I asked dad if I could ask Ashiki to see if he could get me some guitars that I could sell to my students. So he went down to Nagoya where the, the guitar factories were and sent me catalogs. And I went through the catalogs and picked some guitars and, um, and uh, sent him a telex. You know, there was a big cable under the ocean that oh, yeah. That's uh, right. we could send messages. <laughs> Japan, That's right. You know, you talked about a little <laughs> strip of paper. and uh, There was no internet. So, no internet he, then. <laughs> no. Oh, gosh, no. no. So he sent me the, uh, the first group of samples. I remember them because they arrived on the day that John F. Kennedy was shot in November of uh, 1963. So um, I went through them all, and then I placed an order for... 500 guitars. I'd earned a bunch of money doing paper routes and giving water ski lessons and guitar lessons and mowing lawns and all that stuff. And so I ordered 500 guitars and they came in and I hired a friend because I was only uh, 14 then to drive me around to some music stores to see what they thought of the guitars. Uh, my sister had learned how to put decals on them. So I had the Bedell brand uh, on these guitars. Well, as it turns out, they were the same guitars because I didn't design them as um, other companies were selling in the U.S. with their name on them. All right. <laughs> but okay. I had priced mine at 50% of the price. So um, I didn't have any overhead. I had my, my folks garage at basement. I had my sister I paid a little money to. And I had a friend that uh, drove me. I was, I was the rest of the whole company. So everywhere I went, people bought them. But by the way, so was, the, was, there, the, was there any uh, competition backlash at that time? Or was, <laughs> was anybody uh, coming after you or what? You know, I don't remember that, but it was, you know, I was just a little pipsqueak. I was 14 years old. <laughs> That's amazing. Probably weighed 110 pounds. And, yeah. um, and I think people were kind of like, who is this kid? You know, is this for real? That's awesome. Uh, but every store I went to, because, you know, they said, shucks, if you can sell them to me at that price, you know, I'll take them. So then um, the Beatles showed up on Ed Sullivan in February of 64. And as you recall, Jeff, the whole music <laughs> thing just exploded. It did. It changed. There were grass bands changed. on every corner. Yeah, I right? was doing that. You yeah, that's what I did. did. <laughs> that's right. <Yeah. laughs> so uh, I opened my first actual music store in 1966. So that year I opened the second one. So I went through high school in the music business, went to school in the mornings and worked in the afternoons and um, built up a really nice little business. Then in 1968, my parents convinced me that um, – I had a long life in front of me and that I really should go to college. <laughs> so I sold the business, went to the University of Colorado. 
um, and then live my life like you did in other industries. And when I retired in 2007, that didn't work. So we <laughs> bought the local music store in Aspen, Colorado, and then I flew off to China and um, found what we thought was the best factory uh, in China and started rebuilding my Bedell guitars. Then, so, um, so you restart, you restarted. Later, yeah, that's. I, I went back to where I, my first love, right? Where I come from. And then in, in uh, a year later, the Breedlove Guitar Company in Bend, Oregon uh, came up for sale. So um, I was able to buy it. And then a year and a half later, uh, the, the Weber Mandolin Company in Bozeman, Montana came up for sale. So now we're three brands, the uh, Bedell Guitars, Breedlove Guitars, and Weber Mandolins. We're happily housed in Bend, Oregon with a great factory, a great group of luthiers, and we're having a, just a wee of a time. Now, um, it kind of leads me to uh, uh, my next question, which is, uh, I know you have these these three brands now, and uh, I'm wondering if, you know, before we get into some of this uh, uh, deeper stuff, the uh, philosophy and the methods and all those things, uh, I was hoping maybe you could give us a little bit of the distinguishing information between these brands and kind of how they're positioned. Sure. Um, once I was able to buy Breedlove, then I, instead of importing my Bedell guitars from China, my whole goal was to design them and build them here in the U.S. So all of them now, all Bedell guitars are 100% crafted here in Bend, Oregon. And of course, because of music being the 19, you know, my discovery period was the 1960s. I wanted to build the acoustic guitar sound of the 1960s, what I grew up with. So my Bedell guitars, I would call are traditional. They all have the, uh, the compound taper dovetail neck joint that uh, pre-war guitars back in the 30s were built with. I've got the old bracing patterns. I'll get into the science in terms of how we really make them special later. But, but it basically, when you listen to uh, my coffee house guitar, it sounds like uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. When you listen to my classic folk, it sounds like Bob Dylan playing. And that's the position that I wanted to go for because that's me. And I'm right. doing it because I love it. Right, right. Bre Breedlove's a more innovative brand. Um, the body shapes are all unique. None of them are traditional. That's true. You know, uh, we don't make a dread. Yeah. I, some yeah. of my favorite shapes, too, by the way. I think I told you that. But uh, very, yeah, very interesting. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. Um, and then Weber is totally a traditional um, eight string, four course uh, instruments. They're the the mandolin, um, the mandola, the uh, octave mandolin, and the mandocello. And they're really built to um, <laughs> the old Gibson Lloyd lore or the the real traditional um, uh, mandolin in terms of how they look, how they play, how they sound, the chop, uh, all of that kind of thing. So we've got three very distinct brands. They're all made on three separate production lines with craftsmen dedicated to them. And it's just a, it's a terrific diverse business, but it's all in the acoustic string instrument business. Right. And uh, the Breedlove line is there's both a, a USA uh, product that's made there in Ben, but, but there is a, an imported part of that line too. Is that correct? Exactly, Jeff. So what we've done is um, our USA line starts at about uh, $1,500. And it goes up to, well, we, we sold a guitar to a gentleman for $26,000 here about six weeks ago So uh, from, our, from our custom shop. So you name it. Then we took the science and the, and the art of what goes into a breed love in the U.S. over to a workshop in China. And they're making guitars that we can sell from $299 to about $1,200. Wow, that's quite a so spread. So we're using, yeah. yeah, it's quite a spread, right? Yeah. So we really... We cover the whole range, and we cover it with the Breedlove uh, design all the way through. Mm -hmm. Well, that's uh, I, I think that sets the stage uh, for us pretty well, because I, I think there's no secret that uh, you take your wood pretty seriously. In fact, uh, that may be one of the understatements of the year, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> but, but truth uh, is that uh, you've gone to some great lengths, both uh, personally and as a business, to ensure not only that you're using the best possible materials, uh, but that you've taken a very proactive approach in the sustainability and environmental aspects as well. So I know you have a lot to say about that. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Confession time. <laughs> I am a tree hugger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen so, pictures of that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> They're on the internet. So, Jeff, <laughs> when you when you think about an acoustic guitar, it's completely different than electric guitar. Electric guitar, you can do all kinds of stuff with it. You can put pedals on it. And you can change the sounds with all the electronics and all that stuff. And so the art of being really good on electric guitar is a combination of your skill at, at playing, but also your uh, knowledge and understanding about how to use the various toys that can accompany a guitar, uh, electric guitar. An acoustic guitar is Mother Nature's materials in your lap with you playing your music. It's a completely different soulful experience because the guitar produces what comes out of you, what you play. And um, if you go back in time, and I I won't bore your listeners with much of this, but if you go back in in time to when human beings first started to form uh, societies, music was the communication tool before language was. Mm -hmm. And music was used to communicate among different groups before language was. So if you know how that before we had DNA, if you wanted to trace back to the lineage of where groups moved and how they moved and so forth, music actually and and unique rhythms would do that every bit as well as uh, tracing language or tracing um, artifacts or whatever. It's just part of what we are as a human being. And when you when you listen to people do their music, you know a lot of guys have a hard time expressing their emotions. Put a guitar in their hands and let them write a song, and yeah. it pours out of them. Yeah, what they care about, the who they love. <laughs> yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. It's just incredible. So there's a soul connection, in my view, between us, our music and acoustic guitar, and the forests that gift us the wood to make those guitars. And to me, that's something that I want to honor because I care about the forest, but also because I care about what that guitar means to me when I play and means to you when you play and so forth. So we have a policy that we call it the, the Tonewood Certification Project. And that we will never use any clear-cut wood in any piece of any of our instruments. That um, we will only use wood that is either salvaged, that we found dead, and that's what we use for a lot of our instruments, and or we individually harvest in a way that tries to protect the neighborhood that that tree grew up in. So we're not trying to go in a devastated forest to get a tree to go build a guitar out of. We're trying to protect that neighborhood because just like your family, you got your kids, each one of them's a little bit different, but they're nurtured by their community, their friends, their school, maybe a place of worship. And each one of those kids grow up a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. And that forest is that same neighborhood to that tree. And so we want to honor that. Secondly, we want to honor the people, the indigenous people that live in that forest or around that forest, because if we don't adequately pay for that tree. And if we don't try to help those people build a business where they can make some money on um, milling that tree and shipping us billets and so forth, someday they're going to have an incentive to cut it down. And so we want a relationship with the people. We want a relationship with the forest. Um, I have personally gone to every place that our trees grow, met the people that live in the region that are associated with the forest, and made sure that where we're sourcing that wood from is living up to our tonewood certification uh, project. The one place that I have not gone is to the Republic of Congo, where we source our FSC um, certified African ebony. Mm -hmm. And I've got a trip planned this fall to go there so that I can say I've been to 100% of every forest that we work with. You're going to close that loop. Yeah, well, that should be fun. Yep. So I guess what I wanted to ask you to tie that back into, you know, a lot of things we talk about here is why do you think that that what you're doing in that regard is good for business? Uh, because, there, you know, there are certainly plenty of folks that, you know, would disregard any of that to add to the bottom line. I'm not judging, but um, but I suspect that you could probably tell me uh, the answer to that question. Yeah, Um <laughs> It's really, if you know, if I could meet everybody that buys one of my instruments and tell them the story of what went into that guitar, I would just be the happiest guy on the, uh, the planet. And you'd be busy. Um, <laughs> I'd be busy. That's right. <laughs> but if you look at, at um, Martin and Taylor and the other uh, large acoustic companies, they use clear-cut Sitka spruce in their guitars. I don't. I think that's an important difference in and what's going into our instrument. So I'm going to do a workshop at the Dallas Guitar Show uh, here this weekend. 
anybody that brings in a Bedell guitar or Breedlove guitar, I can look at the at that guitar. Probably in some cases need to look at the serial number to know, you know, the year that we, that we build it. I can tell you the story probably of the tree that uh, we got the wood from to wow. build that guitar. I can tell the story in many cases of what the life of that tree was like. For example, we have a Brazilian rosewood that was uh, dug up back in the 1950s and sent to Spain. So it was way before all the CITES regulations and so forth. And it, it's the finest tone wood that we have in our, our wood library. We went back to try to figure out where did this grow to trace back uh, the purchase order that the company in Spain had used. And we suspect that that tree grew on the side of a of a hill because it has a lot of cross uh, fibers that happen with, with stress mm -hmm. uh, in a tree, like rebarb, mm -hmm. rebar. Sure. And um, obviously it didn't have sufficient water, so it was probably under that stress. We had it carbon dated as 500 years old. It obviously laid in a bog because there's a lot of mineral content that has come up through the the cellulose uh, fiber in the wood. And when you hold it and you tap it, it chimes like a bell. It's just amazing. Well, knowing that story and then hearing it and how it sounds, it changes the way that you feel about that guitar. And I think that's an important part of it. We just built a guitar with 50,000 year old Kauri from New Zealand that was buried in the ice age and ended up in a swamp. And 50,000 years later, <laughs> We build a guitar with it. <laughs> now, how cool is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, we got it. It's a good selling point. And uh, in terms of these extra efforts that you go to with the wood, do you think that the market in general appreciates that, or is there a growing trend toward uh, more appreciation for that, where it, uh, so that it it begins to convert on the sales side? Is kind of what I'm getting to. Well. Um, We'd like At to think so, day, <laughs> right? Yeah. At the end of the day, there's multiple uh, facets of a purchase uh, when you go to buy a guitar. Um, it's actually a um, kind of a heavy experience because you're going to buy something that you're going to play, that you're going to play your music on, that you may be a singer-songwriter, and you're going to express um, your feelings and your thoughts and your soul with, and you're going to be projecting you, your music, and your instrument on listeners. And so you care how that guitar looks. You care how good, how easy it is for you to play, that it fits your music, your style, and you care how it makes you sound. How does, it, how does that guitar sound? It's a, so you buy with your eyes because you care about how it looks. You buy with your, your body and your hands and stuff. You care how it feels and how it's playable. You care um, with your ears in terms of does it fit me? Is it the sound I want? And you, you have to have that guitar fit your play style. So deflection on a top is absolutely critical. If I want to do finger style, I want a big sound, but I want to do finger style. And I want my notes to be very complex. So I want a lot of overtones. That top needs to have a completely different characteristic than if I'm going to be in a, a bluegrass uh, ensemble. And I really want my guitar to almost be a rhythm guitar. I'm going to strum it. The dynamics are completely different. That's number one. Number two, what we have learned is that you take that 500-year-old uh, that sitka tree that was 300 feet tall. It had fought its way through the forest. The seedling actually started to grow before Columbus uh, first encountered America. So you think about the life that that tree has had. I mean, it's incredible. Think of everything that's happened in 500 years. That tree was growing. It was growing inch by inch, year by year fighting its way with the elements and then networking with the other trees in the forest. There's no way that the characteristic of the wood at the top of that tree and the characteristic of the wood holding up tons and tons of wood mass at the bottom of that tree are going to be the same. I can imagine. Sure. And there's no way that yeah. the wood in the middle of that tree that's 500 years old and the wood on the outer edge of that tree that's maybe 20 years old is going to be exactly the same. So we've developed a program that we call sound optimization. And what sound optimization does for us is we take every tone wood set, whether it's from the same tree or different species, and we tap them into what's called an FFT program, it's something that anybody you can download. It, it's an app. And what that does, everything has a vibration. So your table, your floor, your chairs, your body, everything has a, a frequency to it. So you tap this piece of wood into this frequency FFT uh, analyzer, and it shows you the first mode 
the second mode and the third mode that that top is responding to. We dimensionalize it, we um, weigh it, and we put all this into a, a program, and it'll help us understand what the deflection of that is, what the um, thinness maybe should be on that if we want to make a finger style instrument. It should be a little bit thicker if we want to make a strumming instrument. It'll be a little bit stiffer if it's going to be a big body instrument, a little bit less stiff if it's going to be a small body. Um, so it tells us what to do with that piece of wood. Wow. And we take every individual piece of wood and we sand it to that target dimension of what we're trying to build. We then take the back that's going to match or pair with that top. And we know that um, depending upon if it's a small body, it could be 30, 35 hertz of separation. If it's a larger body, it could be 40, 45. It depends upon what you know criteria we're building to. But we know the top, we know the target frequency we're going to build the top to. We, then we know the separation we want to have. We want the back to be higher in frequency than the top. And so then we sand it until we get it to that frequency. So every guitar, we have taken every top and every back and individually prepared them to whatever music characteristic that particular piece of wood delivers. We then put the bracing on and we go back into what we call a hand voicing uh, station and we, again, tap it into the FFT analyzer because there's variability in the bracing. Mm -hmm. And then we'll hand uh, carve on the braces until the FFT tells us we're at the right separation. So let me just uh, add a, a, a quick question here before. Uh, yeah. you're, uh, it sounds like you're doing a number of uh, incremental tests along the way with each one. Uh, you know, was, Do you have a sense of how many times you, you have to test both the front and the back to make sure that you're getting to your target. Is that a, a frequent? We do it three frequent? times. Three times. Okay. Yeah, we do it. We do it when we first uh, sort the, the tone wood before we start to build a guitar mm -hmm. and to figure out the thinness we want to sand it to. We then do it at the, uh, after bracing because we get variability uh, in the braces. Yep. And then we finish the guitar. We put the finish on, we put the, the bridge on, assemble it, get it all done so it's ready to some for somebody to enjoy it. And we go into what we call the, the uh, sound assurance, sound, quali sound quality assurance station. And we again tap it into the FFT uh, analyzer. And there's a fundamental frequency target. So if it's a big body guitar, we're going to want to have a lower fundamental frequency than if it's a small body guitar to get the right projection, the right tonal balance, the right amount of overtones to have a beautiful uh, sounding instrument. So let's say that we have targeted a fundamental frequency of 92 for a big body guitar. And let's say that our guitar is at 94. We then go inside the sound hole and we'll carve away on the braces until we can bring that fundamental resonance down to the 92 goal. Okay. So when you get one of our guitars, we have done everything we can to have the woods in that guitar paired with each other in the right way to deliver the sound for the target play that that instrument was designed for every one that we make. Now, do you, is there any aspect of that that is documented or, uh, or, or goes with a particular guitar? I mean, is that a, is that a factor or is that just information you keep uh, to yourselves? Jeff, that's a fascinating question. <laughs> we are probably three months away we, we're, we call it our guitar portrait. Mm -hmm. And so um, in about three months, when you log in on the, on the website and you type in the model number of, of your guitar, it will actually uh, have a, a spec sheet that will give you all the woods that are in the guitar. It'll give you uh, their uh, common names and the country that they grew in. It'll give you, of course, all the dimensions and all the specs as well. Wow. Then in your case, we're going to actually uh, have another sheet that is going to give you the dimension of your top, the dimension of your back, the frequency of your top, the frequency of your back, the weight of the instrument, and then the fundamental frequency of your guitar uh, as a finished instrument. So you'll have the, uh, the personal data on your own instrument in your case. Now, do you know, We're about is, is any, so you're, th you're three months out of doing that. Um, yeah. Is that... I've never been much of an acoustic owner. I, it's still a goal of mine. <laughs> so maybe I'm going to own a breed love or something. We can fix that for you, yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but um, is, is anybody else that you know of uh, doing something like that to the degree that you're planning to do it? Or do you, do you think that you're going to, that that's going to give you a unique position in the market? 
uh, it makes us completely unique in the uh, production guitar companies. There are certainly, and I'm sure you've uh, met several of these folks, there's some just wonderful um, custom builders that maybe build 10 guitars a year, mm -hmm. um, 15 years. guitars a year, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And so that they literally spend a month on one guitar, and they would certainly apply a lot of these techniques. They do it in their own way, <clears throat> but they would, they would do it. In fact, we learned a lot of this from some of those custom builders. But if you really, if you go back to Stradivarius in that era, it's what they did. They didn't have an FFT analyzer, but they had a tuning fork, and they had their ear, and they would take a violin uh, top and back, and they'd carve on it until it got to exactly the pitch that they were targeting and do the same with the back. They just didn't have the tools we do. And what happened for some reason that baffles me, but I, it's life, is that as guitars became, you know, the the world's most favorite musical instrument, people got into building guitars as cheaply as they could. And then they started treating wood as though every piece of Sitka or every piece of Adirondack was the same, like plastic or metal or whatever. All right. Well, we've known for centuries that's not true. So it's random now. If you buy a production guitar from one of the other companies and from us three years ago, you might have gotten a top that was, was right on. Most likely you didn't because it was random because we carved them all to exactly the same dimension. And so that variability in, in all the wood, if the back w had 30% variability the wrong way, the top had it the wrong way, you got a guitar that just doesn't project. That's why some companies will tell you, go into the music store, play several of this model that you're interested in and find the one that really resonates with you. In our case, we say, you could order it from whoever if you played one of ours and you like it, the next one we ship you is going to sound exactly like it. Wow. So uh, how, do you, how do you fulfill on that? I mean, how, do you, mean? how, do, you, how do you make that happen? When the, this, uh, For instance, uh, what do they have to tell you in order for you to be able to uh, produce that oh, instrument? Oh, I'm just talking, I'm talking about if you want a, a, coffee, a Bedell Coffee House Dread, mm -hmm. which is a, a, you know, it's a model that we sell right. uh, to, to stores across the country. If you went in and played a second one, Mm -hmm. It would sound the same as, as the first one that you played. I see. Okay. Now, no, no, but what you're getting at is where we're going, which is really fun, is if you come to Bend, Oregon, and uh, you want us to custom fit a guitar to your music, the way you play, mm -hmm. we will actually analyze. You'll play. We'll see how you, how you approach the guitar. We'll put different body sizes to see how that changes the way your hand approaches the strings and, and the way it makes the sound and try to fit. Okay, this is the body shape that seems to work. Um, this is the way you like to play. We'll talk about the sound that you're looking for. Um, and then we literally will select a top and then tune it with this FFT analyzer and program that's telling us how to use that top to your goal for in terms of how you want it to sound and how you want it to play. Just like you going into a tailor and getting a custom fit suit. And we're getting better and better at that. I'd say on a scale of one to 10, we're probably at about six in terms of how good we are at that. Because uh, we're learning, you know, every time we do it. And then, of course, we build you the guitar 12 weeks later. Um, you get it. And then, of course, we call you up and say, okay, did we hit it? Does it match wow. your expectation? And the other nice thing about um, using the sound optimization is you can choose... Coca-Bolo or Koa or Myrtlewood or, I mean, you name it. Because we're going to sound optimize that wood, we know exactly how to take exotic species of wood and still deliver to you the sound you want. Because before, we would carve Coca-Bolo to the same dimension as mahogany. The guitars would be really heavy. They would sound kind of muddy. Uh, but the Coca-Bolo was beautiful. Now, we carve that Coca-Bolo to about half the uh, thickness of Mahogany, because mahogany has a 0.59 specific gravity, and Coca-Bolo has a 1.1 specific gravity. It's twice as dense as mahogany, and so we make it half as thick. Well, that makes sense. And, and, the, and it's beautiful. It just sounds beautiful. Well, other companies tend to treat each species of wood to the same dimension. Well, it sounds like it's an amazing... Uh, journey that that not only have you gone through, but that you're continuing to go through and uh, and to provide to your customers. And uh, uh, it's really fascinating to, to hear all this stuff. I want to just kind of shift into a final mode. And, uh, you know, knowing that you've had a, a really long and successful career, only because I can say that because we're, we're you know, we're about 
uh, you know, at the at the same age. And uh, so this is kind of a big and, and broad question, and I'm going to let you take it wherever you want to go. But you know, from your longer view perspective, how do you se- assess where we are now um, in the guitar business, and where do you think we're going in terms of both the uh, challenges and opportunities? And I'll give you the mic. Well, first of all, free enterprise is wonderful because in the end of the day, we can we can create products that deliver benefits to consumers that they didn't think about or didn't ask for, but when they get them, they're delighted. I mean, everybody likes to use the iPhone <laughs> as right, an example, right. mm-hmm. but but I'll use the guitar as an example. Instead of instead of just saying this is all that a guitar needs to sound and, and play like, because that's what people are used to buying, and so if I can just build it cheaper. I think we're entering an era where um, today's consumer, the, the 20 to 45 year olds, they're curious. They they care about the company, the company's values, who are the people that drive the business and who are the people that build the instruments and what do they think about it? What's their lifestyle like? Um, what are what what is Breedlove doing different than another company that might make me want to experience it? Because the younger uh, buyer today is an experiential thinking person. So we have curiosity, we have uh, the desire for an experience. So I think today, instead of the market pursuing growth through how do I get more efficient and and build a lower cost mass produced product, is now how do I build an instrument that will deliver a greater experience to the consumer with the values that that consumer would want the company to represent and with the lifestyle that makes them identify with the company and the product. And of course, that's my life. <laughs> that's yeah. what I love. Yeah. So, uh, um, so I see a, a wonderful future for my whole team here, but mostly it's just so rewarding. Uh, the relationships that we're building with, well, well with um, beginning players, with advanced players, with collectors, just the relationship that they develop with us and we with them. And I think, I think that's where, hopefully where the world's going. So it's, if we were to kind of sum it up, uh, which may be fair or not fair, but, but um, Tom Bedell is really about creating an experience as opposed to uh, just selling a guitar. Does that sound about right? Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Well, uh, I just want to say thank you. Uh, It's been great, uh, Tom, uh, not only getting to know you, but being able to uh, bring your story to our listeners. I'm sure they're going to find it to be uh, quite interesting. And uh, I hope that uh, we can chat again uh, down the road and kind of compare notes and see what's happened um, in that time span. So I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much, Jeff. It's been a real pleasure. Great. Well, as we continue our discussion on taking your business or career to the next level, let's remember that the first thing we talked about was establishing and clarifying your vision. We also understand that visions can change over time. And so it's important to keep our eye on the larger destination so that as the vision evolves, it supports the grander journey that we're on. Next, I talked about implementing your vision and identified three characteristics that, in my opinion, are critical to the process. Those are attitude, focus, and knowledge. Further, I showed you how each characteristic is divided into three elements. Now, you can go back and listen to the previous episodes to fill in the blanks, or we've made it much easier by making each of the value shot segments available by themselves in a special audio format along with written transcripts and you can gain access to all of these independent segments immediately when you join us on patreon and sign up to become a guitar business insider at the ten dollar level very inexpensive very simple to do now in the last episode i started a new discussion about leveraging your knowledge and remember Knowledge, as I see it here, involves its three elements, skills, resources, and experience. So last week, I got into leveraging your skills, looking at it from both an internal as well as an external perspective. And today, I'm going to delve into the next element, which is resources. But first, you may be asking, how do I keep track of all these things? How do I make them work for me or my business? And those are normal and totally legitimate questions. Part of the answer is, of course practice. And if you're a player, you understand that principle well. 
And you know that you don't become a great player or even a good player overnight. And as you've heard me say before, incremental success is gradual, sequential, and cumulative. This is an idea I learned myself from a good friend and teacher many years ago. So that's why I'm providing you with these foundational building blocks that you can, over time, integrate into your thinking. And once we're a little further down the road, I'll be making available to you some additional reference material that should help you do just that. So let's talk a little bit about leveraging your resources. As a reminder, I'm referring to resources that are available to you to help take care of the things you don't know how to do or don't have the time to do or just don't want to do. And in this case, we're talking about knowledge related resources. First, we'll look at the internal aspects and you'll, of course, want to identify what those resources are in your particular situation. Some of the obvious possibilities would be people such as employees, associates, interns, consultants, contractors, or maybe even vendors. In the non-people category, you can think of machinery and automation or information tools or applications. These are all things that function within the confines of your everyday business. So how do we leverage those internal resources? Well, first and foremost, and you've heard me say this before, prioritization. You should develop a comfortable understanding of the value relationship between the resource and the related outcome that it's attached to. You can do this in whatever way is most useful for you. I always like to create spreadsheets, but writing it down in almost any format is generally better than trying to just store it in your head. And once you have that understanding firmly entrenched, I guarantee you it will be much easier to make decisions on how to apply those resources and get the most out of them. This will also help you to determine if a particular resource is the most appropriate for the job or purpose at hand. Now, what about those external resources? And what does that mean anyway? Well, Let's think first in terms of companies and organizations. That could be vendors or suppliers, industry associations, media companies, and of course, the big one, social media. You may also find individuals outside of your business or personal career to be resources. Who might they be? Well, if you're a guitar-related business, it might be players who use your product, or it could be someone who has influence in an area that might be beneficial. And there's certainly more to that, which we can discuss in more depth later on. But again, how do you leverage these external resources? And at the risk of repeating myself again, <laughs> priority rules. Start there. Understand the value of these resources and where and how they affect your business or career. Believe me, organizing this information in a simple manner like this gives you great clarity of thought and empowers you to make better decisions about the usefulness and utilization of resources. You may even discover that some resources are not resources at all and can be eliminated, all of which is healthy management. You know, there is so much information out there on all these subjects by so many different people. It's difficult enough to want to make changes to the way we do things, even when we know we need to. Even if you decide that you need to improve the way you operate in order to move the ball forward, finding the right course of action could be absolutely mind-boggling. That being said, I want you to know that I'm keenly aware of that challenge. That's why I'm giving this information to you in this manner. Small, digestible bites that can be absorbed and remembered easily. And while all of these pieces are indeed part of a larger picture, like I've said before, you can pretty much use each one of them on their own in various ways. And again, as we help you build this improved foundation, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have along the way to fill in some blanks if they exist. All you have to do is ask, and that's pretty easy to do. As always, and you can probably say this with me, stay positive, stay focused on the destination, and keep all the options open on how you're going to get there. And I'll see you on episode 15. And that's it for this episode of Guitar Business Radio. Thanks for being with us. You can stay tuned and stay in touch at guitarbusinessradio.com.